Number four, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only four. We only need four more people to sign up for the Patreon for us to hit our next major milestone for $6 a month which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Katoctin Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, private members content only, and of course, our monthly giveaways. Again, we are so close to hitting this next major milestone. If you would like more information, check the link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aaron. Today, we got a quick 4th of July special for you. A little a little snippet for the day after the 4th of July. Uh, I'm here with Jeff Green of Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. Jeff is going to be giving us a 4th of July weekend update on just kind of how everything is looking on the river. Yeah. It's low and ugly for both rivers, the Susquehanna River and the Upper Potomac River. Water's real low. Um, I'm looking at the gauge right now, and at Edwards Ferry, the gauge is under three feet. So, which means it puts it somewhere right around one foot at the point of rocks. Really? That's, that's insane. That's low. It might even be under one foot right now. I haven't checked since this uh, since this morning. Yep. How's the fishing been? The fishing's been good. Uh, it was tough um, after that. Remember the heavy rain we had? Mm hmm. Um, it, it affected the. Um, the, the area, you know, um, north of uh, uh, Poolsville, that area. And uh, it, it really affected the water. The water had bad clarity. I, I don't know if it's from um, something like an, uh, uh, like an algae bloom um, because of this hot water. Uh, you know, the water got up to close to um, 90 degrees at one point with this, high, um, this, this heat wave we had. And uh, that's not good for the water. It, it, it'll cause all kinds of problems like that green slime you see in the river and all that stuff. It's like a, it's kind of like a cyanobacteria. If anyone knows about aquariums and um, it's just, it's just nasty. And, and the reason why you're seeing that is because of that heat. With that said, how are the smallmouth really situating on the river with the heat, the way it is and the water flow, the way it is? Well, since it's low, they spread out. You think they concentrate, but they spread out. You'll find them anywhere swimming on the river. You'll find a real big one, like a 20-inch smallmouth, just just cruising in a foot of water. And um, uh, some of the, the places that you'd want to uh, target are uh, large structures like big rocks, clusters of rocks, stuff like that, um, points, places where there's a hard bottom, somewhere where they can go underneath. You know, maybe a large tree that's submerged in water that's three or four feet deep. Wow. And you'll, you'll, you'll find them there. That doesn't mean they're going to bite because of the uh, warm water. But you, so, so there's been instances recently where we fished, you know, a spot for 10, 15 minutes. And then I just uh, I'm going to move to another spot. So I um, troll over top of it and there's big smallmouth just swimming out of the tree. What is the water temperature that you're seeing right now? Um, in the, uh, upper seventies because of these colds, uh, these, uh, this cold front that came through, you know, that cool air, mm -hmm. that water loses temperature just as fast as it'll get it. That is true. That is true. Especially because this year it's been, it just started to get hot now. I think the bigger issue is the fact that it just hasn't rained very much. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the only problem. It hasn't rained. It's humid. Well, I guess the humidity is good for us because that's why the water is only going to get as low as it's getting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, you would think it's like, oh man, we keep losing water, we keep losing water. But because of the humidity, uh, that, that water in the air, you know, that uh, moisture in the air, um, it can only lose so much water. My guess is. And then, um, the, uh, you know, if it doesn't matter if it's hot during the day, we just can't have nights where it's like almost 80 degrees every night. That's nasty. It'd be good if it, got down like the mid 60s at night low 70s and it was cool and then in the and then you know later on in the day it got it got warm you know 
It really has. And it's been just a wonky year in general. But but with all that said, and the and the drought and everything, is it really concentrated the fish in key areas? And then also, really, are shade patterns starting to become a thing? No, the, uh, uh, the, the, the deal is when the water gets low, they spread out. Mm. You would think that they concentrate, but they, they seem to spread out. They're all over the river. You can catch them in a spot that's got less than a foot of water. They're just swimming. They have nowhere to, they have no structure to hold to. You know what I mean? No, nothing, nothing's causing them to sit on structure other than, um, large, like large rocks or something like that, where they can, they can, um, hang around and go underneath and stuff get out of the sun, you know, and then, yeah, the, the, the shady areas, but you, you're, you're going to want something that has some structure where it's shady, you know, something that's going to draw them there. Um, uh, it has to be more than just shade, you know, maybe there's some swift moving water through that shaded area, something like that, or rocks or trees, um, or the, the bottom contour of the river changes from soft to hard to, you know, there's gravel, um, a sandy bottom, um, I'm trying to just think of anything, anything where the contours change in the river, where it goes from one foot to maybe three feet, you know, and just drops off. They'll be fishing those spots. It is interesting how this time of year really becomes a strain, I think, on anglers more than fish. Or, or is it both? Is it both fish and the angler? that strain this time of year with the hot weather i think it's both the fish don't i mean the smallmouth obviously don't like the warm water i mean they, they're t they tolerate it uh you know luckily we have more than like florida we have more than like one season um that they, they tolerate it but uh i i don't think they like it um you, you know and when the water's this warm you can find them in real swift water where, where you see ripples in the in the river you know or possibly even uh, where there's a little bit of white water, you know, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll find them there. And then are you still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. And then the, uh, if for people, yeah, no, it's, it's the heat. I mean, uh, I'm going out at, uh, five, five 30, five 45 in the morning on trips. That's really what you got to do this time of year, honestly, is to beat the heat. Cause I feel like the bike does start to die down when you get to the heat, hottest part of the day. And, uh, they're, uh, they're, we got on a pretty good bite. Uh, be, you know, last week with top water, uh, with the customers I was using, uh, or the customers I had, we were using, um, uh, whopper ploppers, uh, the nineties and we were catching them. Um, we caught one that was 21, 21 inches long, big fish. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. What is the top water bite like this time of year? It, it, you know, it, it's going to depend on your water clarity. Um, it's real good early, early, early in the morning. Um, but if we had like cloud cover and it was um, real cloudy all day long and maybe just raining on and off, on and off, you could probably catch them all day long here and there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's yeah, it's just sure. real. It's real good in the, in the morning, early morning and then evenings. The top water bite. Have you ever tried night fishing this time of year? Uh, no, I haven't. I've thought about messing around with it before. Um, I'm sure that they start biting. I'll, I'll tell you what they do, at least on the Potomac, is it seems like right when it gets dark, they completely shut off. They, they just stop biting. And then I'm sure at some point in time at night, they pick back up. I really think that the night bite, that's something I really want to kind of get into now, is figuring out how to catch them at night because you do this on lakes all the time too where you have night fishing tournaments things of that ilk but i've never thought about doing and i get like one issue would be like safety <laughs> like running a well, jet boat a at night probably is not healthy taking, <laughs> i'm not taking customers out on the river and in, in the in the dark I, I might go out there but um i wouldn't take someone that's um that wants to go on a guided trip in the dark uh you're just asking for trouble you know what's uh, the latest but, that you'll go out well, I'll do an, I'll do, I'll do two, two trips a day. I'll do a morning trip and then an evening trip and whatever the evening trip is, if, if I have time to do a six hour trip trip, we just back it up from when it's going to get dark, mm, like eight thirty, okay. back it all the way up to what, two thirty. And okay. you know, at the beginning of the trip, it might be, um, slow, but then you, you'll notice that it just starts picking up as it gets later and later and later. 
And then I bet you, and th this time of year with this kind of heat, if you went out there late at night, but see, then you have to fight all the bugs and the mosquitoes and stuff like that. Um, but if you went out there, I, I bet you there's a bite at some point in time, real late at night, like midnight, one o'clock in the morning, when it does cool down, even if it's um, hot outside. What are your top three baits to be throwing right now? What'd you say? What are your top three baits to be throwing this time of year? Right now, I'd be throwing... Where, where am I at? Oh, right here. Something that looks like a... Um, this is my what? SWFA bait. Or that's, it's that's called cool. SW, SWFA bug bait. Um, I have these on my website. Something like this with a jig head. I would, I would suggest an eighth ounce jig head like this uh, Charlie Brewer slider head because... Um, there's not much meat on this lure. I mean, on this, on this plastic bait. You see how there's not much going on there? Mm -hmm. But what's cool about this plastic bait is the, um, the top and bottom are the same. So let's say you catch three or four fish with this side. Just flip it around, and you can hopefully do, the, do it with this side the same way. Some of them just destroy these things. Though. They'll rip them in half. But uh, this this bait this bait works real real well in warmer water. Um, the black ones work real well. This is a green pumpkin. And then uh, if you're going to be using those, uh, I like the Z-Man baits, the um, Ned rigs, and that this SWFA finesse hook that I make. I pour. I have for sale as well. Um, quite a few people have been purchasing this. This hook right here, I would use it with a. Uh, I'm still going with it, man. I love those things. Z-Man Tickler. Yep, 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 yep. My friend, that's tickler. all he throws. And uh, sometimes, sometimes they'll hit that Z-Man TRD, uh, the, the Ned Rig. They'll hit that pretty good. But I'm telling you, those Ticklers are just killer, man. Uh, is it just because of those tentacles? <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess. I mean, because sometimes they'll, they'll only touch that and they'll, they'll refuse to hit a TRD. Regular TRD. I, I, I assume it has something to do with that, those little legs on the bottom, mm -hmm. the, that profile. I, I think it has to do with the profile, the way that it looks in the water right now. And I, for some reason, I just don't think a lot of people are throwing it, honestly. Yeah. And, um, well, I mean, you know, if you're going to come to me and ask me what works, uh, you know, I'm a, um, it, it's going to, it's going to sound boring because I'm only going to use what, what, I feel is working and usually it's, it's plastics. So it's nothing fancy or shiny, anything like that. It's not like I'm out there throwing a, 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 a new fancy crankbait and just catching tons of fish. It, that that's, that's not the reality. Uh, we don't have the conditions for it. You know, I wish, I wish we could throw a spinner bait and catch them all day long, but that doesn't seem to be the pattern. Is this the lowest that you've seen the river? Yeah, it's um I think I saw it at some point in time last week at like two seven. That's low. And um if you look if you look on the historical data for the uh, river, Potomac or yeah, on the up on the upper Potomac River, Point of Rocks has been around, the the gauge has been around since the eighteen nineties. And they recorded it at some time in nineteen in the nineteen twenties or early thirties, they recorded a um the river being at point three three feet. Mm. So if that's, if that's the case, it, it depends on where they were measuring it at the time, you know, but I would imagine, you know, in the, in the 1890s, they had a guy walk out into the river and stick a um, pole in the water and say, this is how deep it is. Right. And they record it. They had probably, it was probably like a yardstick of some sort. Well, if the water's 0. 0.33 feet and if they're still using the same section of river in the same spot that they put the gauge in now, which I bet you they probably are. Um, if not, it's probably not too far away. Uh, half that river probably didn't have water in it. It probably looked what, empty. What's your favorite gauge to use? Uh, the Edwards Ferry gauge. Why? Uh, it's just the one I've always used. And if, uh, so for instance, if almost 99% of the time this is, this is accurate. 
So if the river, this is just an example. So if Edwards Ferry is reading three feet, um, then Point of Rock should always be reading two feet. That's just an example. Hmm. It should always be reading that. And the water should always be, even up in Brunswick, whatever the, what, what, however deep the water is at Edwards Ferry, the water will always be as deep as, deep as it is up at like Brunswick. Stuff like that. You, 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 know, you know what I'm saying? I didn't know that. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The, the water never changes. Now, unless you have some type of influence from a tributary like the Monocacy River. Let's say the Monocacy River got completely blown out because it, it starts, it's about 52 miles long, and it starts in uh, the Pennsylvania-Maryland line, right? So let's say up there it rains really, really, really hard, and they get an inch of rain up there, but we don't see that rain, right? Mm. That will push so much water into the river, the gauges will be off. So you have to be real careful about that. Don't don't think because the river's up real high, you can go up to uh, Brunswick and run like like you're in a cruise ship. It's well, not going to happen. With that said, do the creeks and tributaries, Antietam, the Monocacy, Goose Creek, do they temperature wise are they usually hotter or cooler this time of year? Um, I guess it. I guess it all uh, depends on the. Uh, how much rain or where the rain's coming from, but they're about the same, maybe a couple degrees here and there, but Is they're, it, they're about, they're about the same. I mean, the, the Monocacy, I would say they're about the same because even Monocacy is so shallow as it's coming down from that 52 miles away to the mouth of the, uh, of, of the Monocacy, that water's got to heat up, you mm. know, if it's a hot day. So they're about the same now. Hey, there's some creeks up and down the river that are fed, completely by springs or predominantly by springs. And uh, for instance, if the water's 80 degrees and the actual Potomac itself, if you go up into those creeks, water will read 75 degrees. So interesting. So really tributaries play, if you think about just fishing in a year, they play in the spring when the water's clearer and they mm -hmm. play in the summer when it's cooler. Generally speaking, those mm -hmm. are the two times creeks usually play more. But then you look at it from a winter perspective, that's when creeks kind of die. And then you got to look at just the main part of the river. Well, those, okay, those creeks that, if there's a creek that's, if you find a creek that's fed by springs, even in the wintertime, this is true. There's one creek I know about that, um, there's actually a couple of them, but this one's heavily, heavily influenced by the spring, but by, by the springs that feed it. If the river is at 40 degrees, that creek can be 46 degrees warm. It can be six degrees warmer in like January and February. Wow. It, it's, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it even where it almost seems warmer than that. Seriously? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if my um, temperature gauge at the time was reading correctly, but I do know that it's uh, there can be a five degree difference uh, over all the years that I've been out there so much in the... Um, and I've used different graphs and stuff. I get about the same uh, outcome. But that doesn't mean the fish push up into those creeks. Those smallmouth will just sit out in the main stem of the river, even though that creek is uh, five degrees warmer or five degrees cooler. Why usually do they do that? What usually influences them to go up into those creeks is high water. Oh, uh, okay. And hmm. low, water, low water seems to... Uh, separate them and cause them to just spread out. I mean, you'll see some fish swimming around. Of course, smallmouth will be around other smallmouth. There's so many in the river, right? But they're just spread out. They run. I mean, they're, they're swimming in spots you've never even seen smallmouth in when the water's real low. It's just somewhere where they wouldn't be, but they're just cruising around. But when the water rises, that's when they um, congregate up and, they, uh, and you'll find them in numbers in a hole. So the higher the water gets, the, the more stacked up they get. The lower the water gets, the more spread out they get. And then when it comes to water temperature, if you find a, a spring fed thing and it's a little bit cooler, there's a chance they could stack up in there and well as well. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But I guess like the only issue with Creek fishing, and I just know this from also just personal experience, is they get a lot more skittish in there. It's a tighter environment. It's one thing if you're waiting. And even when I was waiting and I'm talking like ankle deep water, they, they can feel you. So I can't imagine if you got a kayak or a jet boat, like that's pushing a lot of water in that Creek. Yeah. They, you know, 
and these creeks that I'm talking about, they're not like, if anyone's familiar with Seneca Creek, that, that's a pretty good sized creek. It's pretty wide. I mean, these creeks I'm talking about that I'm going up in are, um, I don't know, they're not even 20 feet wide. So that can probably pay, play a factor in it. I've heard that the uh, guides down in Florida, the ones that fish down in um, like the Florida Keys and down in Key West that fish out in the back country and around the mangroves and stuff like that, that use um, uh, flats boats. They believe, some of them believe that the um, uh, boats, uh, that they can feel the boats in the water because of the um, displacement of water. Isn't that crazy? That's so crazy. So I don't know if fresh, fresh water in the same way. Um, maybe they are. It probably depends on how, how sneaky of a fisher you're going after. Like a small mouse, pretty, uh, uh, they're pretty slick. So they probably can. What is the largemouth fishing like right now in the river? Is it more consistent or less consistent? No, it's not really. Uh, I don't come across them very often in warm water. Really? If, if, if at all. Yeah, no, I mean, you'd have to have some high water event or something like that and end up in a creek that has uh, some, some decent clarity to it after after the uh, the storms passed, and then maybe you'd find some. But I, I don't find them uh, this time of year in real low water. I have no idea where those largemouth go, man. I mean, there's five and six pound, um, I should say, no, bigger than that. There's six and seven pound largemouth that could be caught in the upper Potomac River. And uh, I don't really? know where they go when the water gets real low. Yeah. Guys, let me know in the Over comments the section, what's the biggest largemouth you guys have caught? Just let me know in the comments section. I'm just eager to see what, what some of the fans have caught. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. I mean, we're talking 23-inch 23, 23 inch largemouth in those creeks. Dude, that's a big one. And then sometimes you can't catch them out in the middle of the river. It's happened. I've, I've done it on topwater baits, like early in the morning or late in the evening on grass beds on the Potomac. I know they're not the same type of grass beds as the lower, lower Potomac, but they'll go out and they'll hang out in those big grass beds that blanket the river. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you'll get one to hit your, uh, make your buzz bait or something like that. I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where there's some big large mouth is goose Creek. I wonder that's always been a thing. At least when I was a kid, I wonder why, I wonder what makes that Creek. So I don't know, different. but I mean, but you can go up in there and, and, and not catch a damn one for, a month or two and then all of a sudden um they're there if, if you go way up that that sucker i don't know like how far you've gone up but you will get to a dam um yeah you can only Goose go Creek so Reservoir. far from the mouth of it um you couldn't take even even someone in a um doesn't matter what jet boat you have but the, there's white water up uh about a mile a little bit over a mile up from the mouth of the of the um of goose creek literally white water rushing down the um the creek and um, I don't think you'd want to take a jet boat through there. Well, big how, rocks. How far have you gotten in like high water events or whatever? Have you gotten all the way up into Leesburg? So, but just below those big rocks. Um, how far have you gotten up before? Like in the best case situation? No, up, up there, up where I'm talking about. Okay. Past, uh, past the golf course uh, from the, from the, uh, mouth of the uh goose so creek. you have gotten past the golf course okay cool yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah way way past the golf course but there's a section that you get to and it, it's like it's like real real rough water just before the you dam because like the that's goose creek reservoir because that backs up to uh goose creek reservoir and then beaver dam uh -huh. reservoir so there's two reservoirs you have, you have beaver dam that flows into goose creek reservoir that flows into mm -hmm. just goose creek proper um which is interesting because it's like you can almost get to the tail race i think on a high water event but then if the water's high enough for you to get all the way there, it's probably going to be blown out too. So, yeah, and it depends. And I'll tell you this too: if the water's real warm like it is now, it takes it a while to clear up. If the water's cold in the winter time, it takes it uh, quite uh, quite a bit less time to clear up. I don't know why. It has something to do with um, the uh, you know the sediment in the water just settles easier in cold water than it does warm water. The one thing that I noticed too. Um, from fishing the Susquehanna River for the very first time a couple, like three or four weeks ago, that place, you can have one side of the river be a completely different color than the other, which is interesting because like when you fish yeah. the Shenandoah River and parts of the upper Potomac, it's so narrow, 
it's pretty much it either gets dirty or it stays clean. But on the Susky, it's like, holy crap, you can literally have one half be a completely different color than the other half width wise. Um, do you see that down on the upper? Potomac yeah, there's, a, there's parts. No, um, there's part there's there's a part of the uh, Susquehanna where a lot of the times when I'm fishing up there, it's it's north of Duncannon and I'm fishing up there. The water on the east side of the river stays brown. Wow. It just stays an undesirable uh, color. I shouldn't say not always brown, but it's undesirable in the in the uh, west side of the river is fine. Hmm. So. I wonder why. Yeah. Well, there's there's tributaries up there and stuff. And there's also a dam system up that way. Have you ever gone below Algonquian? Or is that just because of the the how it sets up there with the riffles and everything? Is that just like you can't get down there? Yeah, no, I've never taken my boat down. I've been down below there on foot, but I've never I've never gone I've never taken my jet boat down through there. I like was looking Penny at field and stuff like that. Yeah, because I was looking at it like there's like another damish area below Algonquian, it looks like, or something that cuts across there. Yeah, that's damn too. Ah, OK, gotcha. That's damn two. It, it doesn't exist. It, it, it's it's like damn three. It doesn't really exist anymore. Hmm. It was there, but it's it's like in ruins. Potomac is so weird, man. There's so many of these stupid. It's like if you're going to like make a lake, just make a lake. But all these little like speed bumps they put on it from, you know, six, five, four, three, all the way down. It's just and I get why they did it it's probably for the canal and everything. But still, it's just crazy how it all worked out. So. But Jeff, I mean, I, 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 this guys, this was just a, uh, this was a sampling. This was an hors d'oeuvre because this is what we're going to be doing for you this Sunday, Sunday evening. We're going to be doing a live stream with Jeff fireside with Jeff, where uh, you guys can comment, ask Jeff all the questions that you possibly your heart's content. This is just something I wanted to get out there before, um, 4th of July weekend. So people have something they can watch, get some information on before they go out there on the water. Please make sure you wear sunscreen and you drink plenty of fluids. Uh, Jeff, do you have any closing words? Yeah, hey, uh, watch the live, uh, live stream uh, this Sunday. I'm going to have for probably about two or three days, I'm going to do a 50% off sale on uh, one of my plastics, SWFA plastic baits. Uh, it'll probably be either the uh, bug bait or um, the, uh, I'm trying to, trying to figure out which one would be best, either the bug bait or the, um, maybe the uh, fat stick I have, the finesse stick which is like a uh, Ned Rick. Awesome stuff, sir. On those. So guys, pay attention. Live stream. That'll be going up sometime on Saturday. I'll, I'll have it ready to go so you can find it. But Sunday evening, hey, live stream with Jeff. I'll, I'll have the code. I'll, I'll put the code out on. I'll put the code out on live uh, on the live stream. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Like subscribe. Oh, guys, please be careful. Fourth of July uh, with alcohol and explosives. Those two never usually go well together. Be safe. And I'll see everybody next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. And Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.